Um, and we're really working through the same territory. I'm going to go over this more than once in different ways because it's really quite important. So, again, just to illustrate what's happening here, remember what we've got, a pendulum bob that's being released from one side. So it's starting with uh, uh, a speed of zero, but a velocity back towards the equilibrium position. So the direction is towards equilibrium. The magnitude happens to be zero at the moment. All right, so it's swinging down towards the middle where it's being accelerated all the time because basically it's falling under gravity. So it's going to have maximum velocity at the bottom, but then it's going to start decelerating again as it goes around the outside. So momentarily we're going to have uh, uh, the magnitude of our velocity at either ends of this swing will be zero, and the maximum will be in the middle. Right? So the maximum in the velocity is going to correspond to zero displacement, basically. It's this equilibrium position in the middle. And that's essentially what we've got here. So we're swinging from uh, one extreme, so this is the amplitude, it's r in our equation. Uh, it's going to fall through the equilibrium position, out to r the other side, back through equilibrium and to where it started. So that's our displacement as a function of time. If we look at the velocity as a function of time, or at least its magnitude, uh, at that point it's zero. This is just as we're about to let it go, as it were. When we get back to the equilibrium position, in other words, it's been accelerated under gravity, we get a, a maximum, in this case, in the negative direction. We swing out to the other side, so we're at zero again back through the equilibrium position and to where we started. So back on the other side again. Right? And this would just repeat and repeat and repeat. And remember we got this curve simply by differentiating that curve. Right? So we start with a cosine, differentiate it, we get a sine. Or a minus sine, I should say. Right? If this were a sine wave it would be going like that. So minus sine is simply flipped it upside down. And if we differentiate that again, <coughs> this is what we got. So we get a maximum in our acceleration as we let the thing go. Right, so now it's building up uh, velocity, magnitude of velocity as it's falling down towards the equilibrium position. Uh, if we get to equilibrium there, right, our acceleration now has reached zero. So this is the bottom of the swing. There's no more fall to be had under gravity. Now it's going to rise back out the other side again. So the acceleration is going to go in the other direction. It's going to start slowing it down. So we're going through the, uh, through the axis back out to the other side. And again, that will just repeat as this thing swings backwards and forwards. Um, so uh, that's our um, graphical a demonstration of what we had in terms of equations on the previous uh, previous slide. So now we work through, having sort of talked through that process, we can work through to a definition of what simple harmonic motion is. Alright, so simple harmonic motion then is an oscillating motion. We are talking about waves after all, you can expect that. But where the acceleration of the object, I told you I was going to use this equation here, the acceleration of the object is always directed towards the equilibrium. That's what the minus sign is. Right? Uh, and it's proportional to the displacement from the equilibrium. So it's towards the equilibrium and proportional to the displacement. This, remember, is just a constant. This is just a number. Okay, so if we're looking, we're rewriting this in terms of a proportionality, what we're saying is the acceleration is proportional to minus s. And that gives us our definition for what simple harmonic motion is. And as I say, it's purely in terms of this equation here. 
So this is the key thing. This is a definition you should try and remember. Right? But if you can hang on to this equation, then you should be able to generate the definition from it. Because essentially we're just talking through uh, that equation. Okay, so here it is. Here's our generic equation for simple harmonic motion. The acceleration is minus, because it's back towards the equilibrium, but it's always going to have this form, minus some constant multiplied by the displacement. Now in the case we've looked at here, our constant was only the square. Okay, so if we get a large value of a constant, we're having rapid acceleration. All right? It just means our angular frequency is bigger. So it's going around faster, going through its oscillations faster. Um, which means the acceleration has got to be bigger. Must be. All right? If you're making it swing backwards and forwards quicker, you've got to be accelerating it faster in order to achieve that. And the same applies to the swing of a pendulum, to oscillations of mass on a spring, whatever. All right? We will find in a little while that this constant in the case of a spring would essentially be the spring constant. It would be the constant of the proportionality you get out of hooks on. So the stiffer the spring, the faster the oscillations. Exactly, intuitively, what you would expect to see. Uh, and we're going to be able to describe it, hopefully, we're going to be able to describe it reasonably well uh, mathematically. Alright, so here's the same diagram that we had before, but with a little bit of a change to the um, uh, to its labelling and what I've put on there. So here's, again, y-axis, x-axis. Um, here's our amplitude, it's just the radius of the circle, but here it is over here. And again, we can look at the components of the motion of this point on our circle. Now, initially, we looked at components of the displacement. So it's position, in other words. And we derived from that an equation for the acceleration. We simply differentiated it twice with respect to time. So there's no reason why we can't label this diagram all over again. Instead of the displacement, we can actually look at components of the acceleration. Right? Which is, remember, just minus omega squared times the displacement. So if we're resolving these things, our displacement is either going to be what we get on the y-axis or what we get on the x-axis, depending on which direction we want to look in. Okay, now, the acceleration, you'll notice, is always, if you combine these two components, so this squared plus this squared equals that squared, right? Standard stuff that you've already done uh, in other modules. You'll notice it's always going to be directed towards the centre. has to be. And this is centripetal acceleration. So this is why we always talk, you know, when things are going around in circles. Think back to last term when we were looking at electrons going in circular orbits and I was balancing centripetal force with Coulomb electrostatic forces, right, to get our Bohr equation. This is entirely consistent with that. We are still going to be talking about something going around uniformly in a circle. It's not an electron in this case, it's a blob of blue tack on a record turntable. But the same process holds. The acceleration is always going to be directed towards the centre. So this is a centripetal acceleration. And as I say, we can resolve this into um, uh, components if we want to. Okay, so if we know what the acceleration is, we can also talk about what the force must be. Because force is just mass times acceleration. <coughs> so we can write down an equation now, instead of saying acceleration is minus omega squared s, we can say that force is minus m omega squared s. Okay, so we've established really, really easily uh, that um, 
if we're going to get something oscillating in simple harmonic motion, the force acting on it must be always directed towards the equilibrium and always proportional to the displacement from the equilibrium. All right, so in the case of our oscillating pendulum bulb, the forces acting on it are due to gravity. All right, that's all it is. But we're saying that if we resolve that force of gravity, which of course is always going to be vertically, as it were, towards the Earth's centre, if we resolve those uh, in appropriate directions, and I'll do this for you in a little while, uh, we will end up with... Um, the same sort of equations that we've used before. All right, so the forces acting on our pendulum bob must themselves be proportional to the displacement from the equilibrium and directed towards the point of equilibrium. But we can flip it over the other way, and that's the point of the final uh, statement on the slide, because we can say now that if of the force we apply to an object obeys those rules. So if we impose a force that is always directed towards the equilibrium and always proportional to the displacement from the equilibrium, we must bring about motion that is simple harmonic motion. We couldn't do anything else. Okay? So this is a very simplistic extension of our master equation up here just by remembering that force is mass times acceleration. So what is true of acceleration must be true of force and then as I say all we've done is turn it over the other way and say that if those are the forces we are applying to a system then we must end up with simple harmonic motion. Okay, follow the logic? Good. All right. I'm guessing those are forensic science students judging posters, but um, if they get too excited by blood spatter, I'll you know, ask them to keep it down a little bit. Um, okay, now we can do the same thing as I've illustrated already with masses on springs, all right? So, so let's pick this apart in a little bit more detail. Um, and all we're going to rely on is Hooke's law. So the extension, you remember, have you done the Hooke's law experiment yet? Still not come. Sorry? Okay, some have done it, some have. Okay. But the Hooke's law uh, experiment is simply demonstrating the fact that uh, the extension of a spring or a piece of wire, whatever it is, something acting like a spring, is proportional uh, to the load that you've put on it. Okay? So double the load you put on your spring, you will double its extension away from its normal equilibrium length. Right? And that's essentially all that's being um, put into that example on the screen, halfway down the screen there. Right, and the tension in a spring is always given by the spring constant, so in other words, the stiffness, the strength of the spring, uh, multiplied by this extension. Right? And that's essentially, remember, what Hooke's law is saying. If the extension is proportional to uh, the force acting on the, uh, on the spring, it's proportional then to the mass times g. Right? It's just mg. So the tension in the spring is, is basically mg. So mg is going to equal kx. In other words, uh, um, the extension x is proportional to mg. So double m, you double x. And k is just the constant of that proportionality. And it's the stiffness, as I say, the, the, uh, the spring constant, the stiffness of the spring. All right, now, what that's basically telling us, and I'll try and demonstrate this in the next slide or two, uh, is that the restoring force acting on the mass is always going to be um, in, towards the point of equilibrium and proportional to the displacement. 
right? The tension is going to be the source of the force. Right? It's always towards the point of equilibrium. Right? It's trying to move back to its rest position. If you stretched it and let it go, for instance. Um, and um, it will depend on how far you've pulled your mass away from the equilibrium position what the strength of that force is going to be. So we're going to find that all masses on springs will oscillate with simple harmonic motion. They will have an acceleration that is proportional to the, to the displacement from the equilibrium position and towards that equilibrium uh, position. All right, so that sets something up that's maybe a little bit more complex in a way. Uh, to work this through, only a little bit. All we've done now is put two springs into the system. All right, so we've got a mass in the middle, and it's connected now through two springs. So we can make this thing oscillate. We can move it away from its equilibrium position, and it's shown with some particular displacement there um, at the moment, and we can just watch it oscillate back and forth. So this is actually a pretty decent model for an atom bonded to two atoms to either side, for instance. Right? Um, so think of it in that way, in a sense. Now if you do this experiment, I hope you get a chance to do this, because the kit is in the lab. I, I just don't know what's on the menu, as it were, for the lab sessions uh, this term. But if you now plot the displacement against the restoring force, how would you measure the restoring force? Really, really simple method of doing it in this setup. Just take a spring balance, right? Hook it to the trolley. See what the reading is as you pull it away from its equilibrium position. All right? Dead easy. Um, so it's like, you know, hanging meat from one of the scales that you see in pictures of avatars and so on. Um, and that's essentially what we're measuring here. So this is the force that's had to be applied to move our mass in the middle, the trolley as it's labelled on that diagram, away from its equilibrium position. Right? And that force goes up the further away from equilibrium you get. So we go away from equilibrium by some distance or other, we have to put more force into the system to do that. And it's called a restoring force because whilst we've pulled it away from equilibrium, what the trolley, what the mass is trying to do is move back towards the equilibrium. Right? So hence the word restoring. It is going towards the equilibrium point. If you let go, then our mass just oscillates backwards and forwards. And if we take all friction out of the system, it just moves backwards and forwards indefinitely. So we would end up then, as a function of time, if you plot the displacement, we get the sort of classic uh, sinusoidal variation. This is just showing uh, a fraction of a wavelength here. Right? This would go back up and round to get a full period, as it were. So we've got half a cycle, essentially, on that graph. All right, so let's break this down and get hopefully get something useful out of it. Um, let's, we've got two springs in this system, all right? So two spring constants. I'm going to label them very prosaically as K1 and K2. So we move our mass away from its equilibrium position, uh, and our uh, spring constants are going to be trying, our springs, sorry, are going to be trying to move the trolley back towards equilibrium. But one spring is working in one direction, the other spring is working in the other. We've compressed one where we stretch the other. Alright, so our combined spring constant is essentially going to be the combined effort of those two springs to move our mass back towards its equilibrium position. So the total restoring force then, it's still going to be um, in this generic form, still proportional to the displacement, right? It's the equation we had, 
wherever it was, back there, right? Or at least derived from it. We've put the minus sign in because we know it's a restoring force. So our total restoring force then is just the sum of the action of those two springs. So if I write K1 plus K2 as a combined constant, these are just constants, remember, uh, and put that in as K, then if the force then would be minus K times S, then the acceleration simply requires that we divide that force by the mass, so the mass of the trolley. Because force is just mass times acceleration. So if that's true, then the acceleration has to be minus Ks divided by whatever the mass of this object is. Right? Which is exactly the same form as this master equation we had up here. It is still the case that the acceleration is directed towards the point of equilibrium <coughs> and is proportional to the displacement. Everything else in there, the K and the M, are constants. They're not variables. Right? One is associated with the springs, their strength. The other one is just the mass of the trolley. So I can essentially say that what we've got up, written up there as k over m is playing the same role. It's just the constant of proportionality, right? That we've had omega squared in here. And the omega, remember, came out of this motion in a circle. Right? This is us borrowing bits of math from one setup and putting it into another. So if that's true, if k over m is just our constant of proportionality here, then it follows that omega squared must be just k over m. Right? They're equivalent one to another. And if that's true, uh, then given that we've now got omega, we can work out what a time period for this oscillation will be. So this is the time period, I don't know, let's switch to atoms. This is the time period for the atom in the middle to go through a complete cycle of oscillation. And all we need to know uh, is the mass, so the mass of the atom, and what the spring constant is. So this is the uh, interatomic bonding that we're looking at in our experiment, say. So if we can measure that, we can actually determine what that is. A neat experiment, really. So we've got something very straightforward as, as an equation. So we've got a mass oscillating on the end of a spring between two springs, whatever you like, it doesn't matter. Um, and out of that, out of a very simple uh, process through to being able to establish that this is the case, we get to an equation at the bottom that says that we know what the time of the oscillation must be in terms of a property of the springs, so K, and a mass, because it's just following a simple harmonic motion. Okay. okay, so let's continue with the theme of springs, but this time we'll flip it through 90 degrees. <coughs> excuse me, my voice is still croaky. A little bit more water, if you'll excuse me. Warm water with colouring. Um, We've got on the left there um, a mass causing an extension to our spring, uh, our spring's natural length. Okay, so that's its equilibrium position, uh, and that's fine, right? Presumably we're all happy with that. We have a force acting on the mass, which is mass times g, uh, and that's balanced if this mass isn't moving. Uh, that's balanced by the tension in the spring. And the tension in the spring, Hooke's law, remember, uh, is just going to be the spring constant multiplied by whatever the extension is. Okay, so we've got a perfectly balanced set of forces. Right, now we do something a little bit sneaky. Uh, we actually pull this mass down, so we introduce a displacement from its equilibrium position and let go. So this mass is now going to oscillate around its equilibrium position. 
but now we've changed the forces a little bit. We've still got our downward force as, as mg, that's unchanged, but the restoring force, the force that's trying to draw this mass back up again, is now the basic spring constant times the initial extension, but we've <coughs> added further extension now, so we've also got spring constant times displacement. Right, and obviously the K is a common factor there, so we're going to better factorise that. It will be K uh, times the total extension in the spring, which is just X <coughs> plus S. And that's essentially what I've worked down in the text on the left-hand side of the slide. So our resultant force then on the mass is going to be whatever the tension is, which is that, minus the weight, which is that. And that's a force that's going to be acting, uh, in this case, uh, upwards. So again, if I jumble all of this around, cancelling things out, whatever, factorising, I end up, at, <coughs> excuse me, again, with a restoring force, which is minus uh, K times the displacement. Now remember our extension to the definition of simple harmonic motion. If the acceleration is always towards the equilibrium and proportional to the displacement, then the force must be correspondingly towards the point of equilibrium and proportional to the displacement, because force is just mass times acceleration. Yeah? So if that is true, then this also is going to oscillate in simple harmonic motion. Must do, because the forces of, um, acting on it are in the form that are required for simple harmonic motion. So the acceleration must be, all we'd have to do is to divide both sides by m, uh, and we get to acceleration. <coughs> 